So today we're taking a look at another graphics card. It is from Nvidia and it is a little bit of an oldie, but it also has a special place in my heart because I actually had one of these when I got back into PC gaming, which spurred the creation of this channel. And today I'm just gonna catch up with it and see how well it performs. Now the graphics card that we're looking at today is the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1650 and it was created by NVIDIA in 2019 so it makes it about five years old now. Not the oldest graphics card in the world but because it was such an entry level card you could actually start classing it as uh, on the borderline as a potato type graphics card nowadays and the reason for that is because it kind of meets that definition. The definition being that it will uh, struggle to play the latest games and it clearly does but even when it was released it was actually a pretty good option. When it was released it would play pretty much any game on the market and it had an extremely low retail price and what also made it very unique was the amount of different versions they came in you could get them in itx you could get them with dual fan configurations like this one they did a super model i believe at some point they did a ti model but i've never actually seen one they also came in very low profile and because of the low very very low power consumption of them a lot of them didn't even come with pcie connections so they actually were perfect for people upgrading those dell optiplexes and all of those types of pre-built systems and they actually sold very very well these were extremely popular at the time and they even took first place on the uh, steam hardware survey for a very long time so all in all they made a great option for nvidia and it was good to see that they released an entry level card or at least a budget card that would give the budget gamers some real options to play the latest games while also being able to save on power and save on cost too i believe that these were probably one of nvidia's best budget level cards in a very long time because of how diverse they were how dynamic they were all that kind of stuff you could use them in pretty much anything and of course i actually picked one up when i got back into pc gaming I actually built a system during the start of lockdown because of boredom and I just wanted to get back into it and I picked up one of these. I paid a lot less for this. This isn't the actual model that I picked up. I picked up one that was a single fan ITX version. It was also from Gigabyte but it wasn't uh, as fast as this one. It was a little bit slower but it actually surprised me very much and, and spurred all of this channel taking off. I've upgraded obviously since and I actually donated that card during the uh, lockdown season to somebody that was building a PC and couldn't really afford the parts because nobody could um, so hopefully it is still gaming out there and hopefully somebody's still having fun with it but I managed to pick another one up in the form of this this one is a little bit different than the one I previously had because it does require an extra power connection it is an overclocked version from Gigabyte it's the Gigabyte Eagle model and it does come with a little bit of an overclock on it so it's a little bit faster and of course because it needs the extra power connection it's not as useful as the others. You will need a power supply that has at least a six pin connection, but generally it is very good. And the specifications of this one are pretty good too. This card in particular has a GPU of a TU117. It has a base clock speed of 1,410 megahertz and a boost clock speed of 1,815. That's about 14% over the standard version. When it comes to the shaders, it's got 896, which is not the most in the world nowadays, but it is a little bit old. So we'll give it that. And it was extremely entertaining level when it was new for memory it has four gigabytes of gddr6 and that's one thing that actually makes this card stand out from the others because that is of course an upgraded model and along with the oc you can pretty much see how it would perform better it has a memory bus of 128 bits so although that is a little bit low to today's standards it did also have a pcie interface of pcie gen 3 by 16 so it doesn't suffer like uh, things like the rx 6400 did and of course it has a maximum power of around 75 watts which of course means that it could actually run from the pci slot itself but for some reason they did give it the extra power connection so it's a little bit weird but it's okay for anybody that does really want to upgrade a machine or at least an older one sometimes you can convert your sata connections i wouldn't advise doing that but a lot of power supplies out there particularly in pre built that we've built in the past they do tend to come with a single six pin so you're going to be all right if you're doing that these also retailed for around 150 pounds which was an absolute bargain for a brand new graphics card back when they were released and they did kind of sit between the gtx 10 series and the 20 series you can kind of see these really as a 20 series card but without the ray tracing units and things like that because they were so popular and so diverse they do hold their price a little bit i actually paid around 80 pounds for this one about a couple of months ago which is kind of insane for the performance but i really wanted one for the studio but the one I actually originally bought which is about three or four years ago now I bought that one brand new for about 80 pounds again it wasn't the OC version it was the normal ITX version but either way that was actually a great price at the time that was just before 
the GPU crisis. So I kind of scored a little bit there. And at those kind of prices, of course, lots of people bought them too. But this one in general is a very nice looking model. It does have a backplate. It's only plastic. You can't really, it's not really going to affect the uh, temperatures or anything like that. But it does look nice in a system. It does have these uh, twin fan configuration here, which is quite nice. And they kind of go the opposite way around. So the fans do blow the other way. So it's got that Gigabyte kind of cooling technology in it. The little uh, logos on the top here, it does say Gigabyte on the side. So it looks nice in the case like that. But also when you tip it, it's got the Eagle logo in the background. It is a shame that that doesn't light up. I originally thought that it would. And if you were to vertically mount it in a case, Lighting up saying Gigabyte Eagle would have looked really nice, but of course it didn't. That was a little bit of a shame when I first picked it up. But either way, this model doesn't look too bad in a full system. If you fit an ITX card in something like this, they do look a little bit silly. They look a little bit small. But actually, if you fit this one in just like this, it actually has a nice length to it. It is about the length of a standard size motherboard. So you're not going to look too bad in there. And of course, you're gonna have a nice looking system. I would actually prefer to vertically mount this card because I think it just looks a lot nicer. We'll just pop it back out and I'll show you what it would look like. I mean, if we had a vertical mount in here, it would actually look pretty smart just up like that. It kind of fills the space a little bit, although this case is a huge case. So either way, it's going to look a little bit silly. Overall, I do love this little graphics card. It's always going to have a place in my heart. But how well will it actually perform in today's games? It, when it was released, it would play anything on the market. And today it's really starting to struggle a little bit. We tested it in this system. This is our bench and rig. So it's got a 5800X3D with 32 gigabytes of DDR4. So nothing should hold this card back. And I don't think it did. I think it did extremely well for what it had. Had, but we'll show you some benchmarks and then we'll talk about some of the results.
as you can see from those benchmarks, this little card actually held up pretty well, although it does have to have a bit of a crutch on some of those games. Most of the games we had to enable something like FSR to get a 1080p high 60 fps experience some of them didn't even make it that far so it wasn't great all round but it did extremely well particularly for how much you would have paid for one of these back then and if you're still using it now across all of the games we got a pretty decent average fps the alan wake 2 only managing to get an average of around 43 meant that it was probably one of the worst performers but again that did have to get lowered down to a low setting with FSR 2 set to performance. It does take away from the gameplay experience a little bit when you lower the graphics that far, but it is still playable at that and you can still get away with it. Although some of the games did throw us a few wobbles here and there. When it came to Doom Eternal, you were very limited on the amount of VRAM, which meant that you couldn't actually increase the settings, which was a little bit of a shame because even in 1080p high, the game looked okay but it still had some more power in it to be able to go up to like an ultra setting. The game just wouldn't let you go there. The four gigabytes of VRAM really do hold this card back a little bit. And we got the same when we looked at things like Alan Wake 2, just because of that limitation of VRAM. You get a warning when it starts up, although it does let the game start anyway. The newest game, of course, that we tested was Space Marine 2. It's one of the newest games that I've purchased, and also it is one of the newest on the list. Running that game in 1080p with a low preset while enabling FSR with the quality, we did manage to get an average of 51 frames per second with a 1% lower of 41. But again, it still suffered from that VRAM issue where it would cause errors in the uh, settings so it wouldn't allow you to turn it up or down any further which was a real big shame but overall though i think this card has done exceptionally well even on those modern games even though you did need to uh, lower a lot of those settings down to pretty much console like experiences but it did actually prove that you can still play modern games on a gtx 1650 albeit this is the gddr6 version of it but you're going to be able to play them even if you are having to really lower those settings and kind of destroy your picture quality a little bit but for those of you that are out there that are using these you're probably using them because you are on a very tight budget and if you want to play those games you have to make some kind of sacrifices but anyway that is our look at the GTX 1650 here in 2024. Let me know in the comments below if you have one of these cards, what kind of games are you playing and what kind of experience you're getting. Are you even looking to upgrade soon? It's probably about time that you should start thinking about it. And these cards still get a pretty premium on things like eBay. So it's definitely worth selling them. If you are going to have an upgrade, you can get a little bit of money back to put towards your next upgrade. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content. We have a lot of graphics cards to get through because we've been doing a lot of builds lately and all of those builds that have been turning up particularly older systems have come with graphics cards and we like to take a kind of a, a proper look at them in a in a system that's not going to hold them back so again don't forget to subscribe if you want to catch them and i'm sure as always i'll catch you guys in the next one